everybody to the next episode of uh, Bones and Stones. Today we have Hildegard Muller uh, joining us. Sorry, Hildegard, I actually forgot to ask what your current affiliation is. Is it still University of Basel in Switzerland or is it changing now? Well, I just finished uh, my study, so I'm somewhere in between. So still a okay. little bit attached to the University of Basel, but yeah, <laughs> we'll okay, see. So in a bit of limbo at the moment. Okay, but, but uh, Hildegard, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, for Hildegard's efforts, you know, she was nominated as the Student Presentation Prize winner uh, for the quality and value of her scientific contribution at the recent 14th meeting of the Workbone Research Group Conference. Now, this is a conference uh, or an event that discusses the significance of bone tool technology in light of human evolution. And, and particularly when we start investigating uh, de the development of complex technologies uh, and early symbolic behaviors. And obviously bone has played an important role in how we answer these complex questions about the uh, development of our species. Um, this is a conference that was recently hosted by Professor Justin Bradfield uh, and the Paleo Research Institute uh, at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. And myself and Dr. Caruana, uh, in, in addition to the remaining PRI staff members, were all part of the local organizing committee. So it was great to be part of that. So as a winner, Hildegard, uh, you've since received a cash prize from the Paleontological Scientific Trust, which is based at, at Wits University in South Africa. But just to maybe provide a bit of uh, context quickly, you know, there were only two prizes uh, up for grabs at the conference. Uh, and this is a conference that spanned 38 different presenters, um, 51 different institutions, and 24 countries. So congratulations, uh, Hildegard, for your well-earned prize. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to see and to hear your talk, and we thought it was a great idea to ask you to join us today uh, so we could learn a little bit more about you uh, and the research that you're doing. But uh, to maybe just kick things off, and for the benefit of, of you know, some of the viewers, uh, some of whom maybe would have missed your presentation and maybe didn't attend the conference as well, um, could you maybe start by telling us a little bit more about yourself uh, and specifically how you got into studying bone tools and artifacts and what specific periods in the archaeological record uh, you focus on? Yes. Um, so my journey with bone tools started in 2018. I um, was preparing um, to, to write a bachelor thesis and I was like, I didn't really know what, what to do exactly. And um, at first, when I started studying archaeology, I wanted to go more into the ar agronomical side because I'm a farmer starter. So that was more a little bit my, um, my goal, actually. And bones was, always, bones was always something really fascinating to me. And I was thinking about what could I do? And one friend of mine, she told me about user analysis and then it kind of started started rolling um, and I got two, um, two, two teachers at our university, um, Dorota Wojciak, she's doing um, user analysis mainly on stones but also some on, on, um, on bones and the other um, teacher she's specialized in Roman, she's an archaeologist in, um, specialized in uh, the Roman era. And then of kind of starting building up um, with, with, with the whole project. So the basic idea is um, I started during bachelor, um, for my bachelor thesis and then continued into my master thesis on the use of Roman bone artifacts. And the problem there is um, this era is, or this, this area is highly um, based on typological um, functions. So the, the functions are, are we, have, we have a lot of, um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the, the whole Roman bone, so the function of the Roman bone tools has multiple things that um, when, when, when archeologists assess those, those artifacts and there are experimental archeology, span there is just the place, the context of where it's found and everything. And then one of those, um, one of those, another method, which is um, very important or is done a lot of times is the typological approach. And, 
um, there are the typological approach has some problems because some people are um, not the same. There are just big discussions and uh, about about certain certain tools. And so that was the basis of 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 the idea, basically the idea of this um, first thesis that maybe we've used where we could get a new view on this. So, um, but since this is a high, com a highly complex and a big field, I started first uh, with experimental archaeology. So, I first uh, learned how to use the lathe for turning bones, uh, for turn turning wood, and then I worked together with a bone craftsman, and she told me how to carve uh, bones. And from there on, um, I started my first experiments. And in my BA, I um, assessed for typologically um, classified um, artifacts to steely and to spindles. And I made, um, I made replicas of, of, of Roman steely and I used them for writing. And then I made my first steps into the use where um, from there on, I made more experiments during my master thesis where I had um, more bone artifacts from Roman time. This time it was uh, typologically assigned hairpins. And I made different experiments um, using them as hairpins, using them as cloth uh, planes for um, linen and for wool, and also as a leather needle. And during this work, one of the most amazing thing that I, for me, or the most interesting thing was the manufacturer and doing the experiments. I, I am still learning, so I'm still at the beginning, but it's, for me, it's so much fun just um, from the start when I, when I, I, my raw materials I get from the butcher. So I get, I, I'm, I'm usually going and collect the, the, the cow feet and then I start carving out the metatarsal so the hind uh, foot um, from the cow and from there on I start. And this is something um, I really like. I like to, to experience. Of course, I'm not as exper experienced as a Roman artisan, um, but I'm still learning and it's a lot of fun. And also then when I started um, comparing the Roman artifacts to my experimental work, and I saw that the Roman artisans sometimes made the same mistakes as I did. And so this is something which is, for me, it makes archaeology a little bit more touchable. So I, I see it, it's more, um, I, I see how they, they, how they produced those things. And I kind of can understand it and connect it. And I think that is some some really interesting thing about archaeology and also it's not just like sitting there and reading in a book it's I actually can do something can take history into my own hands and try to to get a grip grip on it so that's a little bit how I get got into it and yeah now I will see where it's going from here yeah now thanks Hildegard it's incredibly fascinating and you mentioned uh, so many important concepts that uh, the three of us as Stone Age archaeologists are very familiar with. Issues with typology, doing experimental work and use where stuff to essentially understand the artifacts in, in greater depth. Um, we are all too familiar with the issues of typological systems, uh, typological classification systems. Um, so it's very interesting, you know, for, for you working on a completely different medium, bone, working in a completely different period, Roman uh, uh, period artifacts, that you are kind of grappling with a lot of the, uh, the same issues. Um, maybe I should bring Matt Caruana in here because I, I know Matt has particular experience uh, in experimental archeology, span at least from a lithic point of view. Um, and I mean, Matt, you're very familiar with the, the, the benefits of an experimental approach when it comes to stone age studies. And I imagine there's a lot of commonalities when it comes across to, to bone studies as well. Yeah, uh, Hildegard, when you said you could see the mistakes of, uh, of people making bone tools in Roman times, it really touched home uh, because I'm, I'm looking at stone tools that are, uh, you know, probably well over a million years older than the bone tools you're looking at, but it's the exact same thing. 
And uh, I often find that the mistakes can be very informative. Um, I was uh, just wondering, do, do you get any sense of, of how skilled these craftsmen were when you're sort of comparing your own experiences in the manufacturing process with the archaeological remains? Um, do, does, is there any insights that are provided from when you're looking at these sort of like common mistakes as well? So I'm not that um, far into my studies that I have seen thousands and thousands of artifacts. I'm just really at the beginning here. Um, but it's really um, diverse, I think, from the point of view that um, I had artifacts which were, you kind of had the feeling it was just like really fast done. So it's a... Um, for example, when I was looking at those hair needles, they usually had a really nice um, on the on the on the proximal head where the I make it like this. Maybe easier to explain. So this is just the simple hair needle I have. But usually, when you have a, a Roman needle, um, the proximal end, so the end where the beautiful thing is, what you usually see. Um, it's sometimes done very nice and then the rest where you don't see it's just like nobody saw it nobody nobody cared and then there are also um, some hair needles I saw which were, were crafted with the lathe very beautifully and skilled and I'm I am not as good uh, yet it's going to need a lot of uh, more experience for me to get to this point where it's um, very very smooth very very pretty um but even though even on those hair needles you still could see some chatter marks which um i also read i mean there is already a lot of uh, literature out there about roman um manufacture of roman bone artifacts and this is some something other researchers saw too like for example those chatter marks and this is attributed to um that the tools are not sharp enough, that um, something you usually get, you usually um, they write about it in connection of a lathe, when you use the lathe on something, um, or then that the, the worker isn't skilled enough, or it's just like a little bit of inexperience. So I saw that as well, sometimes on the same artifact. So this is, this is like, it, it was a beautiful, artifact but still you could see it's not 100% perfect and usually when we go into the museum we only see the very amazing beautiful stuff but it's it's not just that it, it's it's a lot a, mo a lot more and it's um those were tools or for the daily use so you could see there was a big difference between some artifacts so some artifacts you really had to feel it was just like someone was working five minutes and then and on the other artifacts, you really had to feel it. That's a lot of work that they had to put in there and a lot of experience. So I think this difference was for me also quite interesting. But yeah, I would look forward to see more artifacts too. I think, thanks, Hildegard. I was, I was going to ask a question during the uh, conference session after you finished your presentation because you presented the, um, the hairpins. And yeah. um, you spoke about the use where that developed after, you know, wearing them for like a thousand days or, or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> and you had a picture, you had a picture of the hairpins and they were in someone's head. And I thought to myself, yeah. I was like, hey, wow, who's, whose head are they in? And you just pulled it out of your head now. So now I know that you were conducting the experiment and, and you yeah. were actually the, the test subject with the, yeah, the, uh, the bone um, hairpins in your head. So that's, that's incredible. Uh, but maybe just to, to backtrack uh, again for the benefit of, of some of the viewers, could you maybe talk about uh, your lathe setup? How exactly did you set up the lathe? Because during your presentation, it was incredibly interesting how you spoke about that. You said you used a, a fiddle bow drive. Um, and yeah, so could you just maybe talk a little bit about the manufacturing process with the bone tools? Yes. So um, I, during my, the, during my bachelor um, thesis, I built a, a lathe out of fur scraps that we had like lying around and it was a really simple one. So we, I just had a, a chuck between um, two wooden pieces that I um, that was moving through this fiddle bow 
drive. And with the help of this um, very simple lathe, um, I, I made the first experiments, but this lathe was a little bit wobbly because it was my, my first one. And now for my master thesis, I continued this time, I, I built it with oak wood, which is much, much more sturdier than the, the fir wood. It also meant it was a, hard, a lot harder to build it because I had to carve it out. And um, it was basically just um, two blocks on a on a kind of a, I don't know how to say this in English, but on on a bench. So I had these two blocks, and one of them was movable, so I could uh, put the chuck between it, and uh, um, through through the fiddle, I could move this chuck. And um, it's a, it's still not the perfect lathe because. Um, I'm not uh, a trained woodworker or anything closely to that. So um, when you're using a lathe, if you have some really small increpancies, um, it starts to be wobbly sometimes. And this is something really interesting to work with, because, but sometimes you just spend five, five hours on this lathe just to get it as straight as possible. And um, I have a friend and she's, um, um, she learned, um, she's a professional bone carver and she's a professional um, artisan on the lathe, on, on wood. Uh, so I was in contact with her and at one point she took a look at my lathe and she gave me a lot of, lot of inputs. Um, but there is still a lot to be done. And just for example, this was, all wood on wood. So for example, I built that lathe on a normal day, on a sunny day. And the next day when it was raining, the wood was like um, expanding a little bit. And then I had so much troubles to, to use the lathe because it's just those little problems that we usually don't think about. But when you're actually doing this experimental work, you start to, to realize it and also how much skill it needs. I mean, yeah, I can produce some hairpins, but I'm, I'm still really at the beginning. There are many years to go until I'm on that level that uh, a Roman artisan probably would be. Uh, thanks, Hildegor. Thanks for explaining that. And, and sorry, I'm, I'm about to hand over to Tim. He's got a question for you. Uh, but, but my last uh, question, just with regards to your, um, your lathe setup. So would that setup with the fiddle bow drive be period appropriate? I mean, is that how they were sitting up their, um, their lathes during the Roman period? We don't really know because there is no lathe. Uh, we don't have any depictions. We don't have any um, lathe they, out of the Roman period. But one of the closest thing that is usually cited in literature is a picture of a Hellenistic uh, grave in Egypt around 300 AD, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, but there's a, a, a big de debate and there are a couple of um, experimental archeologists who um, built lathes and they're all a little bit different. And it's really interesting how they, how they are. And um, I built my lathe uh, based on a lathe um, from Astrid Dingleday. Um, which was this, this friend I spoke earlier about, and she reproduced um, some life for, for example, for the Museum of Xanten, and she does some really incredible work. But this is one possibility. Um, some people, uh, especially like um, concerning about metal work, um, they say that it was probably possible that the Romans with their skill already had lathes, which turned uh, around all the time. So like when you have a fiddle bow drive, your your chuck turns alternately in opposite direction. And But there's a possibility that the Romans already had much more advanced lathes, but we it's still a discussion, we can't prove it. So it's a really interesting thing. If you look into the literature, there are a lot of different opinions about it. 
Thanks, Hildegard. That's really interesting. Um, uh, I wanted to just sort of maybe, I don't know if it's taking it a step back or, but in terms of the bone tool technology that Romans had, um, you've spoken about the hairpins, but what other types of tools were they producing from bone uh, during, the, during that period? Um, you, you mean just the, 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 not the tools that they used for producing to, but bone tools itself? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm just yeah, thinking okay, down sorry. here in Southern Africa, we have we have a variety of tools that some people might be familiar with, and I'm just wondering how similar they are, not in terms of technology, just in terms of function and and uh, perhaps morphometrics and so on. Um, well, it's they use tools for all kind of uh, all kind of things. So I mean, there are a lot of um, spoons out of out of bones. There are sword hilts. There. Um, they are little, like, I have this, it's, it's antler and wood, but they call it uh, pixies. So they had um, a kind of that thing. So, or they had also, for, exa for example, um, door hinges or like cupboards. They had all decorative kinds of, so it's, it's just everywhere. Bones was like the plastic from our days was, was was the was the material for the Romans? So it's, it's really interesting. Now that's the incredible variety of uses for bone, and it's such a it's such a versatile material, I guess. So that's why it can be applied in so many different scenarios. Yeah, I mean the only the only problems with bones is the the that you do, I mean when you have a piece of wood, you have such a big piece of wood, or even bigger, and bone is much more. Um, how do I say that? It, 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 yeah, you, you, it, it, it's less, you're a little bit limited, just about the form that bone, bone gives. But um, more than that, it, it's really interesting material to work with. It's very homogenetic and um, it's amazing to work with. Yes. Thanks, Hildegard. Maybe just a follow-up question, um, uh, just in relation to, to Tim's question. So you, you've mentioned, obviously, the different types of tools. Could you maybe just summarize briefly the different types of use wear uh, that you then found uh, on these different types of implements? What were the kind of characteristic patterns that you found uh, on each? So I'm still really at the beginning with the use wear because on one thing, I'm just very, very new to the, to the method myself. And I only have done um, five different um, experiments. So I um, used them from writing on wax tablets. Um, I used them as leather pin, as um, linen pin, as wool pin and as hair pin. And it's, it's as far as I can see now, um, so for example, for the, for the steely, we had the, the, the traces were really concentrated on, on the, on the tip that you use to really um, write in the wax. And um, it's, it's much more, um, so what we could little bit distinguish is just, just the, the places where the pattern developed for the, yeah. But um, for example, also like a hair pin, it's much more evenly, just from this, um, the, the patterns that, that, that are left from the hair, it's much more than I actually expected. I didn't expect much for it, but you have like um, a, a polish that develops everywhere, mostly because just the hair is almost everywhere. And then, for example, compared to a steely, where you really have the location on, um, on, on, on especially the tip that you used to. Um, this is just like one, one example, but um, we have to do a lot of more experiments. So we, we only have a few now, but we need a lot of more research done there. Mm -hmm. um, and Hildegard, in terms of these bone tools and all the products they use are producing from bone, uh, is there a lot of it very diagnostically Roman? So when you see it, it's classically Roman or were many people producing similar types of uh, work bone and bone tools at the time? And then were these being traded or moved around the landscape so you can track the movement of the, this technology or of those people? I'm not very, 
I can't really, I, I don't know that much about, about the Roman tools. I was more like really um, focused on the manufacture there. But there is like um, a lot of different types of, just if you take hair needles. So um, for example, if, if, if you take the hair needles from Austria or Switzerland, some are really um, similar. There are many, many time, types of, of, of different ones. And it's also not, um, for, um, it, for the hair needles, it, it's a little bit hard to say where they come from. So it's also not, um, it's for example, also discussed who produced it because we, we can't really um, say, maybe people produce them at home. There are different opinions about this so far. Um, so if, if someone produced them at home, if you really had artisans, and uh, we also don't really know the, exactly the tool who produced this because there wasn't just not, um, that wasn't the focus on the research so far. Um, well, or like we don't have the, you know, maybe I have to say different. It's just like, we don't have the fines to, to really say, um, these, these people there, they produced those tools there with, with that kind of metal tools. It's, as far as I know, um, we don't really can, can tell that. But for example, what we can tell here in Switzerland is that um, those door hinges that I said earlier, um, they're way bigger. If the bones are, or the bones must have been way bigger than the bones of the cattle which were locally here. So this is something that we know. Okay, that must have been an import. But if we don't have something like this, it's it's a little bit hard to to tell about it. Yeah, cool. I Thanks. don't know if that answered your question. Oh, that Very fascinating. Great. Well, thanks, Hildegard. I think we're going to uh, come up on time now before we get booted off uh, Zoom. But I just wanted to say thanks you much again. And again, congratulations on your presentation. Um, you know, the one thing that uh, all of the uh, um, prize adjudicators were saying uh, was hey, how great your presentation uh, had a you know, balance of text, balance of, of images. It was very dynamic. I think you had some videos as well of, of your experiments and stuff. So it was really, really uh, interesting to, to listen to and, to and to see. And I know obviously we've got some content showing during this video now as well. So I hope the viewers do enjoy it. But thanks very much. Uh, it was great to have you, you on. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the, uh, the um, future research and future publications. Who knows, maybe one day the four of us should write an opinion piece on uh, the problems with typology <laughs> and, uh, you know, the value of use where studies across different mediums, bones and stones. Anyways, but Hildegard, thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, you so much for you. We'll chat soon, yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.